Now, in spite of the fact that Tsongkhapa himself declined reincarnation as a formal institution, uh, his uh, first disciple, or one of his main ones, was Gendun Juba, whose dates are 1391 to 1474. He did attain great awakenings himself personally in his own lifetime, and he performed great deeds founding the huge Tashi Lumbo Monastic University in southern Tibet and teaching hosts of disciples. Then after his death, he turned up reincarnated as the son of a yogin and yogini couple of central Tibet. When he, once he began to talk, the minute he began to talk, he revealed he was the reincarnation of Gendun Druba. And, you know, I want to go back to Tashi Lumbo and I want to teach my disciples. He started telling everybody. So then, although it was a little complicated for the abbots of Tashi Lumbo, because they were following the Dzongkhapa example of the most learned abbot becoming the head of the order, but nevertheless, they couldn't deny the power and the accuracy of the memory of Gendun Gyatso, as he was named, and so they did accept him as the reincarnation of Gendun Truba. He did spend long years in retreat, though. He didn't really act as an administrator of the monastery, particularly, and he was not the head of the order. He didn't request to be head of the order, but, and he spent long years of retreat, gave great teachings, built more important monasteries in eastern Tibet and in central Tibet, and made daring inner voyages as an adept or psychonaut, as I like to call them, in parallel and in contrast to our astronauts. And his writings indicate his, a great attainment and great uh, insights, and his, his, his writings are used by the later ones. Then he again reincarnated in Sonam Gyatso, who, a lama who became called the Sonam Gyatso, who also continued this program and also visited the northeastern part of Tibet and built great monasteries there, especially the great giant monastery Kumbum, which was built on the site of Dzongkhapa's birth and carried on the same education program and the expansion of monasteries in the east northeastern part of the plateau, particularly. And uh, eventually he was invited to the court of the Mongol king Altan Khan, who was the emperor of the time, like the Genghis Khan person of the time. Somehow he turned the, tamed this formidable warlord, taught him it was better not to throw captives into the Yellow River for sport, better not to sacrifice war captives or animals to the ancestors and the war gods. And instead of, of that, uh, to take refuge in the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and practice renunciation, compassion, and wisdom to create the lifestyle where many individual Mongolian human beings could evolve to become Buddhas. The story of their meeting is quite marvelous and always reminds me of the story of the return of the king in the, in the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy where the young king came back with all the ghost warriors. So they, it said that Altan Khan had a vision of, Alta, of, of the Sonam Gyatso arriving at his camp with a huge army of deities, <laughs> fierce deities riding on horses and dragons and things. So even his huge Mongolian army was not like the biggest power. He had like a vision like that. So then Altan Khan was so impressed by his encounter with a person he considered to be sort of a superior being, almost like a super shaman. He, a more involved life form, he gave him the name Dalai Lama, Dalai being Mongolian word for ocean, since they at least had seen an ocean of grass in the vast steppe that they lived in. Counting his two predecessors retroactively then, Sonam Gyatso became known as His Holiness the Third Dalai Lama. Toward the end of Sonam Gyatso's life, the social situation in Tibet, this is toward the end of the 16th century, was becoming unstable due to the, the growing resistance among the Tibetan aristocratic warlords to the ascendancy of the fully monasticized civilization, the mass monastic one, what I'm calling sociologically, coming from the Tibetan Renaissance of the 15th century. So the fourth reincarnation chose to be made in Mongolia as a grandson of Altan Khan. Uh, cementing sort of the tradition's connection to the Mongolians and spreading even this mass monastic thing, beginning the spread of this monastic me method even among the Mongolian people. By the end of the 16th century, the secular rulers of Tibet felt overwhelmed 
by the popular dedication to enlightenment education, monastic vocations, and monastery building. A period of violent persecution of monasteries ensued. They shut down the Munlam festival in the late 16th century, for example, so that the people couldn't gather with, uh, beyond the sectarian identities and so forth. Basically, this is often sometimes misunderstood as a conflict between different Tibetan so-called sects, which I prefer to call order because there really wasn't that much different between them. And so it's misperceived that way, but basically it was rather that the secular aristocratic warlords were trying to assert themselves to eclipse the rise of the monastery-centered spiritual lifestyles, so, which were taking away their armies, taking away their land uh, taxes, taking away their peasants who were becoming monks, and the ladies were becoming nuns as many as possible to get away from the labor of the sort of more militarized, more socially uptight type of society. So in curious parallel with what was happening, simul this was all in curious parallel with what was happening simultaneously in the Reformation in Europe. In the later Ming Dynasty in China, with the cutting back of the monastic uh, land holdings and so on, and the numbers of monks and nuns, and with the monastery suppression by the shogunate in Japan. In other words, it was a Eur uh, Eurasia-wide movement, as always these things in Tibet are. The monastic leaders resisted the effort, and the warlords yet relentlessly tried to then turn the different orders against each other and act like it was a sectarian conflict. The Dalai Lama is by now a widely beloved spiritual leader, called for help from the Mongolian king Gushri Khan, who had become his disciple. The Mongolians swept into Tibet and crushed the coalition of secular kings. And these kings were disarmed by that, and a peace was made that elevated the main monastic leader finally in 1642 to head the nation.